All right, we'll uh, go ahead and get started. So good morning, everyone. I'm Joshua Ott. I work in the Stanford Intelligent Systems Lab with Michael. And uh, my research focuses on autonomous exploration. So that ranges from using teams of robots or, or any autonomous system to explore some unknown environment. So that, that can range from a rover exploring a planetary surface and looking at where to place its, its drill measurements to collect samples of the surface. Or it can be uh, teams of robots, so aerial and ground robots in a search and rescue application trying to coordinate and identify likely areas where survivors will be and then going and exploring those spaces. So as you can imagine, that autonomous exploration relies very heavily on optimization and specifically what we're going to be talking about today with surrogate models and probabilistic surrogate models. So I'm going to uh, pick up where we left off on Thursday on surrogate models and then we'll dive in to probabilistic surrogate models. So if you recall from Thursday, we were talking about surrogate models and we left off on model selection. So we had already fit our model to some data and now we're trying to evaluate the, the quality of that model. So the data that we've used to fit it, we call that our training data. And so that's what, that's what we use to create our model based on whatever data we've seen so far. Once we, once we have that model, we want to evaluate how good is our model doing at data that we haven't yet seen. So how well is it generalizing to data outside of what we've just trained on? So to do that, we want to look at the generalization error. And this, this is giving us some metric to say, this model's doing well, this model's not doing so well. Okay, so that's, that's what we're sort of after here. So one way to, to quantify the generalization error is we can just write it like this. Is everyone able to see this board here? Yeah. Okay. So we can write the generalization error as the expected squared error. So we'll, we'll walk through this here in a second. Okay, so we have the expectation over all of the x's sampled from this space of x's. So this is all of the, the possible data we could see. And then we have, this is the true function value. So this is what we're interested in, right? We don't actually know that function value. So we have our surrogate model here. And this is what our surrogate is telling us. So, so this is a good definition to work off of. The only issue is that we don't actually know this function value. So, so it's a good definition to go with, but it doesn't really get us anywhere right now because we don't, we don't know this to start with. So another thing that we can, we can think about is the training error, right? So this is how well we do on the data that we just trained on. So very similarly, we can write that like this, where we have, we've seen these M data points so far, and then we're just looking at the error on those specific data points. Okay, so now this avoids this problem because we know this. We've gotten these data points, so we know the function evaluation at those specific data points, and we're comparing that with what we predicted. So that's our, our training error, and this is good. It gives us, gives us some metric. The only issue now, though, is that just because we have a good training error does not necessarily mean that it's a good model, right? We might do really well fitting our, our training data, but we might generalize terribly to other data that we haven't seen. So, so that's still an issue that we have. And, and that's just the, the main point here is that models with low training error, they can still perform poorly on, on data that we haven't seen so far. So the, the training error is not necessarily a good indicator of our generalization error. So one way to, to get around this issue is through uh, using the holdout method. So this attempts to estimate the, our generalization error by looking at, uh, we, we partition our data, our data set into a training and test set. Okay, so we have, some, we have some entire data set that we've collected, and now we're just saying we're, we're gonna take our 80% of our data and we'll call that our training data, and we're gonna save the other 20%, and we're not gonna use that for fitting. 
and that's our test data. So, so this is nice because we, we basically still get access to this. We're just saving, saving it for later, okay? So we take our, our blue partition here, our training data, and we train on that, we fit our, our surrogate model, and then we're gonna test on the, the red data here. So an example of this that you can see, the blue points here, those were our, tr our training samples. So we fit some model on, on just those uh, data points. And then we saved the two, the two red points over there for our uh, test data. And so now we can see, well, hey, our model does not do very good at predicting those, those data points over there. So this is sort of an indicator for us now that, okay, our generalization error in this case is not very good. So that's, that's the, uh, the holdout method. We're just partitioning the data, saving some of it to, to evaluate on. So cross-validation extends this idea. We're still, we're still partitioning the data set. It's just now, instead of just doing this train and test split, we're partitioning it into k different subsets. So in this case, we have five subsets here. Each one we, we just randomly partition up, so one through five here. And then with those partitions, we're gonna walk through this. And so at, at each iteration that we're going through, we're going to use one of those partitions as the holdout set. Okay, so if we, if we walk through an example here, let's look at this. So we've, we've partitioned our data up into these five different partitions. And now at the first iteration, we're gonna go through, we're gonna hold out just the purple partition. So just this uh, D1 partition here. We're holding that out, we're gonna train our surrogate model, fit it on this data only, and then we're gonna evaluate it just like we did in the holdout method on our purple data. And that gives us one generalization error estimate. We then repeat this. So now we do it a second time. This time we train on everything except for the blue partition, and then we use that blue partition to get a, another generalization error estimate. So then we can just repeat that for the rest of our partitions. And as we do that, we end up with now uh, k different estimates of our generalization error. And so with these, we can then just take the mean and standard deviation of that generalization error that we got, and that'll give us a new, a new estimate. So some mean and sigma for our, our generalization error. And you might be saying, well, why, why not just do the holdout method? Why do we need cross-validation? Well, the whole point of cross-validation is that it makes us less susceptible to how we partition our data. So in the holdout method, you can think that maybe in certain cases, the way you partition that data gives you a sort of biased estimate of your generalization error. You might partition it in a way that you get a really good generalization error, but if you had partitioned it you know, just a little bit differently, that would no longer be the case. So cross-validation removes that, that dependence on the partitioning by doing this, this random uh, partitioning into different subsets. Okay, so any questions on uh, cross-validation or holdout? Yes. I guess um, if we go through and we do it this way, technically at some point we have trained our model on all the data, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good point. Um, so you will, at, at each iteration, you're gonna be eventually accessing all of the data. But the, the sort of caveat here is that at each iteration, you're, you're not having access to the, the entire data set. You're only getting access to that specific partition at that iteration. So it's still hidden to you, and then you get that estimate. So you might have really bad generalization error on one specific partition, and that'll affect your mean and standard deviation. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So this, this doesn't tell us specifically which model to select. It just gives us sort of uh, an idea of based on, on the model type that we were using, so maybe we're just doing like a linear fit, it tells us that based on how we partition that data with the linear fit, this is sort of what we can expect our overall generalization error estimate to be. All right. So today we're gonna to be talking about probabilistic surrogate models. And uh, this is one of my favorite areas in optimization. And there's, 
Two, two main reasons for that. The, the first is just that they're extremely versatile. So they're very widely ap applicable, whether you're looking at uh, geoscience modeling, so looking at minerals in the subsurface and sort of modeling how they, they change spatially, or if you're looking at financial modeling, they're applicable there as well. So anytime I see that where, where something is, is used in two very different fields, that's sort of like a, a flag in my head, like, hey, this is, this is pretty cool, this is important. So that's, that's one of the reasons that I, I really like probabilistic surrogate models, it's just the versatility. The other reason is that I think it's just a, a very powerful concept of being able to quantify the uncertainty in your prediction. And I think that sometimes gets overlooked in, in modeling applications because you just have your model and it's doing a reasonable job of, of predicting what you haven't seen yet. So you're saying, okay, great, that's, that's awesome, it's working well, but you're not, you're not taking that uncertainty quantification into account. So I think that idea is really powerful. So versatility and un uncertainty quantifications, those are the reasons why I, I really like probabilistic surrogate models. And my hope for the lecture today is to really give an intuitive understanding first and then dive into the math and the details. So if you, if you ever like lose that intuition of why are we doing what we're doing, just feel free, ask a question, and, and we'll dive into that. So to start off with, looking at today, we're going to be going probabilistic surrogate models first, what they are, how we use them, and then we're going to be looking at how can we use them for our actual optimization uh, purpose. So I, I want to start off first with just sort of zooming out, looking at the, everything we've seen so far, all of the different pieces of optimization and where, where this fits in. Okay, so, so today we're focused here on probabilistic surrogate models and surrogate optimization. And you can see it's sort of its, its own sort of branch in the, the optimization topics that we've covered so far. So that's not to say that everything on the top is not important. It's definitely important and uh, necessary to learn about, especially if you're going to be using this in your work. But the nice part is that probabilistic surrogate models are sort of their, their own, own branch here. So my hope is that if this is the first lecture you're attending all quarter and you're just dropping in right here, that you would still be able to walk away from this lecture with, uh, with a solid understanding of probabilistic surrogate models. So that's my hope. Okay, so let, let's get started here with just a refresher of, of why we care about surrogate models in the first place. So in, in many different optimization problems, often the actual evaluation of the function is pretty expensive. So the function that you're actually interested in optimizing, getting those uh, sample values are, are expensive. So for example, if you're doing some lengthy hardware fabrication process that requires you to build uh, the actual hardware design before you test it and get that function evaluation, that's going to be an expensive process, right? It costs a lot of time and it costs a lot of do dollars to go and actually get this, this hardware prototype and then test it. So a good example of that is if you're building an aircraft and you want to test it in a wind tunnel. You can't just go and build thousands of different aircraft prototypes before you actually ship one, right? So you have to have some way to predict how your, your function will evolve based on the limited samples that you've seen so far. And lastly, maybe an another example here is you're, you're about to go train some new deep neural network and it has you know, billions of parameters and it's gonna take weeks to months to train. You wanna make sure that your hyperparameters in there all, are all tuned up nicely before you go and spend $500,000 training that, that model. So that's where the, the surrogate model comes in. It's a surrogate of the actual function that we're interested in. And so because we're talking about probabilistic surrogate models, naturally we would think that there's gonna be some probability involved here. So we're gonna start just with a refresher of our friend the Gaussian distribution, and then, and then we're gonna work up from there to the Gaussian process. So I'm sure most of us have probably seen the Gaussian, Gaussian distribution at one point. This is just the, the expression here for it, where we have some mean and covariance matrix. And in two dimensions, we get something that looks like this, where these are just the, the contour plots of it, so just taking the slices here, and just looking at the effect that the covariance matrix has. So as we, as we change that covariance matrix, it sort of changes the orientation and shape of our, of our Gaussian distribution here. And so if we want to look at, you know, different, different 
distributions with the Gaussian. You know, we can have two jointly distributed random variables A and B, and we can represent them like this. And so that, that allows us, like any distribution, we can marginalize out one of the, one of the variables. So for a general uh, probability distribution, marginalization is just integrating out with respect to one of those, those variables. So we can just integrate out the effect of, of B on our distribution, and that gives us just, just A. Okay? And then lastly, we have the conditional distribution. So this is just saying that if we already know the value of B, we can say, what is, what is the distribution now that we expect of A? So it's A given B, and we just represent that here through the Gaussian update equations. So it's just, uh, we just have this given value of B, and then we're using that to condition on that value of B, and that will give us a new Gaussian distribution for our A. Okay, so that's just a, a refresher, because we're going to make use of these in building up the Gaussian process. Okay, so for Gaussian processes, we're going to start with just a visual example here to, to build that, that intuition. So we're, we're going to start, and it might seem a little weird at first, but what we're going to do here is we're just going to plop our, our Gaussian uh, distribution in one dimension, and we're going to take it all along the, the y-axis here. And then we're just going to take five samples from that. So we get our, our five samples here, and we're just plotting the dimension on the x-axis. So here it's just one dimension, so they're all just along that, that first dimension there. And then we're just plotting the value of the samples along the y-axis. So that's all we've done. Pretty simple. We can then take the same exact idea and we're just going to build it up to higher dimensions. So if we go to two dimensions now, we can have our, our two-dimensional distribution here. We take again five samples from that distribution. And now we're just going to, we're going to plot the dimensions along the x-axis here. So we take the first x1 dimension and we plot it there. And then we're going to repeat and we're going to do the same thing for the second dimension. So we take the, the values of the, from the second dimension now and we're going to plot them corresponding to the second dimension. So all we've done is just taken those values and plotted x1 on the x-axis and then x2 as well. And their sample value is on the y-axis. And then we're showing the covariance matrix here. So you can see there's nothing you know, special about this. We're just showing that there's, there's some correlation here as well. All right, so now we can just rinse and repeat this up to higher dimensions. So if we go to three dimensions, you can see we get some samples here. And now we're just, again, there's nothing special here about this particular covariance matrix we're using. All we're, all we're trying to illustrate is that there's just some spatial correlation now. So the value of x1 is more closely related to the value of x3, or sorry, the value of x2 than x1 is to x3. So the closer you are in dimension, the more uh, relationship you have. And so you can just see that through the, the covariance terms uh, in the matrix. Okay, so we can. Oh yeah, question. I think maybe like the zero point six one in the last uh, in the last row should be zero point one. Yes, yeah. that's true. Uh, I, well, so yeah, th this zero point one four should be uh, zero point six one. This one here. Is that what? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so we can continue that up. So in four dimensions, we can do it in five, six. We'll stop at eight for, for this case. So we, we have uh, five samples now from an eight-dimensional Gaussian where we've just plotted them uh, along the axis here. Okay, and so maybe these are starting to look a little like uh, samples from a function to you. And if they're not, then we'll, we'll clarify it by going up even higher dimensions. But uh, that's exactly the, the intuition that we're trying to get to here. So if we, if we take this up to you know, hundreds of dimensions, so let's go now to like 200 dimensions, we'll start getting these smooth looking functions, okay? And we still have that spatial uh, correlation here. And so all we've done now, we just have you know, lots, of, lots of samples now, and we start getting these smoother looking functions. And so that's exactly what a Gaussian process is. It's just a distribution over functions. And all we're showing here is five different samples from a Gaussian process. Okay, so it's just distribution over functions, and all we're looking at here are the samples uh, from that, that function. Okay, so if we want to make this connection a, a little clearer, for a multivariate Gaussian, we have it defined by some mean and covariance matrix. For a Gaussian process, 
We're just defining it by some mean function and some uh, kernel function. So we can sort of write out the structure that we're going to be working with here. So we're just going to write it like this. And we're going to break this down in much more, much more detail as we go. But just so we have a starting point here, we have our, our y's. These are the points that we're going to be observing, so our, our function values. And we're saying that those are coming from a Gaussian process, which we're defining by some mean function here at the points that we've seen. So the m, m different data points that we've seen. And you can think about this. This is very similar to the mean vector that we have with a, with a Gaussian. And then we have, some, we have our covariance matrix as well. That might be cut off for you guys over there. OK, so we're just, we're just writing it out for all of our n different data points. And we're just going to be making use of this in the rest of what we're going to be talking about here. Okay, So all we have, we just have our, our mean function specified on, on our data points. And then we're looking at the, the covariance matrix here is what we built. But we use this covariance function or this kernel function here. And so you might be asking, what, 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 is this, what is this covariance function? Well, that's sort of the modeling choice that you have. But a very common one, and the one that we'll be using a lot uh, today, is the squared exponential kernel. So how we write the squared exponential kernel So we have our, our squared exponential kernel. It's just, just the negative exponential here. And then we have some length scale parameter. So, so what this looks like, if we were to draw it out, it looks something like this, where we sort of get this decay. Okay? And so the length scale controls how fast we're decaying there. All right. So if we, if we want to look at some, some examples of this, So this is just the same exact structure that we've written. And this is sort of the, the definition that we'll be, we'll be working with here today. So if we look at some examples, this is using the squared exponential kernel. And we're, we're just looking at, we've already seen the center one, where L equals 1. Now we're just looking at how, how does that length scale change the types of functions that we're getting. So as you can see that as we decrease the length scale, we get much more jagged, sharply varying functions. And as we increase it, we get more slowly, smoother varying functions. So that's, that's sort of showing the effect that the, uh, the kernel function has on the type of function that we're using. And so just like that length scale parameter, you can see it has a pretty significant impact on the types of function, uh, function samples that we get. The kernel function itself that we're, we're choosing has, has an even bigger impact. So if you want to look at you know, we're, we're not just limited to the squared exponential kernel. We can use any, any number of these. These are just examples. There's even more out there that you can use. So you can see that the, the choice here makes a pretty, pretty significant impact on the types of functions you're going to see. And so that's where it becomes your, your modeling choice of which one to use. And so I'll, I'll highlight two here. We've already seen the squared exponential kernel. Uh, the second one is the matern kernel, this one down here that you can see. And, uh, they're, they're quite different, right? The matern is much more jagged and has those sharp, sharp spikes in it, whereas the squared exponential is a lot s smoother. And so the, the reason I'm highlighting this is just one example is in uh, the geoscience modeling. Often when you're looking at you know, minerals in the subsurface, they're not just these smoothly nice varying functions. There's a lot of noise there with these jagged discon discontinuities in the subsurface. And so a common thing to do is take a combination of kernels. So you can represent the smooth nature of the, the spatial changes in the subsurface, but you can also represent that, that sharper varying uh, term as well. 
So that's just sort of a, an example to highlight how you can, you, t you can take combinations of these, and it's, it's really that, that modeling choice. And you can use sort of the previous things that we've talked about, like model selection, to determine how your, your model is doing here. OK? Yeah? So now what is the x-axis? Uh, yeah, the, the x-axis here, these are just uh, basically like the x's that you've seen. So these are the x's that you've seen, not necessarily where exactly you have data, but just where you're querying this, this distribution at. So we have some distribution over our, our y values. And so we're sampling the function values, which is the, the y-axis. And we're sampling those function values at these, these x points. Yeah? Uh, previously, when you had the, uh, I guess, like, uh, in, your, in your board, is m the number of variables or the number of variables? Yeah, m is the number of data points that we have. So this, well, OK, so this m is our mean function. But this m is the, the number of data points that we have seen so far. So we have m data points that we've seen. And we're going to get into a, a little bit of that here in a second. So it should clarify that. Uh, I'm confused because when we were doing examples before, the covariance varies with the number of variables, not the number of samples, I believe. Like, it was increasing in size when you added more variables. Right. Yes. That's. Shouldn't it be like the number of variables? The number of yes, yeah, so the number of variables by the number of variables. Yeah, so so I think the example you're talking about was when we were sort of building up the intuition here. Yeah, so this is this is slightly different, and we'll see it uh, I think in the next couple of slides. Um, but just for constructing, so this is on what we've seen so far. These are the the samples that we've seen. Um, so it's not an, an exact one-to-one -one map to that intuition that we were building up. But I think you'll, you'll see it uh, coming up here. And if you don't, then, then just ask again, and we'll clarify. Yeah. Um, like we are using like, this kernel function for to fill in each of the elements in the covariant matrix. So which means that um, this kernel uh, function is uh, approximating the covariance between the two data points. But how, like, it doesn't make sense to me that we have a covariance between two data points, like how, like, what does it mean to have a covariance between two data points? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a great question. So if we take the, the spatial modeling aspect of it, right? Um, so say that we have, and actually we'll go with uh, like phone prices, okay? So say that you have, we'll go here. Say that we have, uh, we've got prices here and we're looking at the number of sales that we have for those phones. So maybe so far, this is just based on like historical data here that we have. We've, we've uh, sold the phone at these different prices, and then we have data on the number of phones that we sold, OK? So the, uh, the spatial relationship there is just sort of telling us how much we expect the function to change based on how the, the price relationship changes. So I think this one is, is intuitive, right? As we, as we lower the price, we expect to sell more phones because the price is, is lower, up to a certain point, right? So uh, what, what we can do here is we can, we're, we're basically saying that uh, the covariance between, let's say, this price here, we'll call it, I don't know, P1, and this price here, P2, we're saying that those are going to be more closely related than P1 and whatever this point, P3 here. So that's, that's sort of the, the intuition to have, is that the, the closer the data points are, and that distance metric is another thing that you can change, but let's say just in Euclidean distance here, the closer those are, the more related their actual function value will be. Yeah. OK, so here I think we're just going to build sort of a, a mental model picture of what we're going to be working with. So, the black line here is the true function value. So that's what we're actually interested in that we can't directly observe. Well, we, we, can, take, we can take samples of it, but in this case, it's a, a noisy sample. So that's why our black, the black point here is a noisy sample of that function. So all we have right now is one data point. And we can, based on the squared exponential kernel, that's what we're using here, we can then uh, make predictions 
and then sample from it. So those, those uh, blue lines that you're seeing, those are the samples from the function, from the Gaussian process. And so we can then condition on more samples. So as we take more measurements, we can make updates here. So we can update our, our Gaussian process conditioned on these, on these new measurements. And so as we go, with only three data points here, again, there's, they're noisy, so we're, maybe we have some, some sensor noise, so we're not exactly measuring the true function value. And that's why the, there's still uncertainty around those points. But we can basically quantify the uncertainty there that we have around our, our true function. And so obviously this is, you know, with three data points, we're doing quite a good job here. A lot of real world functions are not this smooth and don't look like that. But this is just to sort of have that picture of how we're, we're progressing and adding more data points to our Gaussian process. And it's not just limited to one dimensions. So you can take this up and, and do it in higher dimensions as well. So yes. On the previous slide, I, I was curious what all the different blue lines are representing. When you were showing the different types of kernels, yeah. it seemed like the different lines were the models you would get for each design variable. Maybe that's wrong, but I don't know if we only have one or two design variables here, then what are all the blue lines? Are yeah, there? great question. So the, the blue lines are the uh, samples from our, our Gaussian process. So just like in a, uh, you know, like a one dimensional Gaussian, you have something, you know, you have your, your bell curve like that, and you can take, you know, five different samples from it and get something like that. That's, that's essentially all that we're doing. Those are the blue lines here. So we're just sampling, you know, I think like 10 here or something. And at this point you're sampling the Gaussian process multiple. Yep, yep, okay. yep. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're going along here. We have like 200 query points to make this plot. Um, and at those, at those query points is where we're, we're asking for the function value. And we're gonna, I think that's the very next one here. So we can do this in two dimensions as well. And now I think this, this will hopefully make things a little clearer. So we've, we've seen just like the buildup of this structure, but now we're gonna actually get to the prediction here of how do we, how do we use these to make predictions about, about the function. Okay, so this example that, that we just saw, uh, we're gonna sort of introduce the, the terminology here. So the X's, those are the set of points where we have a known value. So these are our X's here. That's where we, we have those known values that we've measured. The Y's are the, the points that we've actually observed. So those are the known, known values of our function corresponding to the X's that we have. The X stars here, those are the points that we want to make predictions at. So in, in this case, the X stars are basically the entire X axis domain. We've just very finely gone through and said, like we have 200 X stars in this, in this domain here, okay? And so those are the, the, fun, the, the points that we want to predict our function at. And then lastly, the Y hats are the actual predicted values that we're making. So the, the darkest one is showing the mean, and then those, those lighter samples are, are just showing different samples from the distribution. Okay, so that's, that's sort of breaking it down, and now we'll, we'll, we'll build up what, what we're actually talking about here. So just like before, we can sort of write the joint distribution here, where y hat is the predicted, uh, the predicted values, and y is the values we've actually seen so far. So we have our mean function. We can get the mean at both the points that we've observed and the points where we're making predictions. And then we're just building this covariance matrix, which if you think back to that initial slide on Gaussian, uh, on multivariate Gaussians, these are just our A, B, and C matrices that we're now using in our, in our Gaussian process. Okay, so we can extend this now. So this is just the expression for our mean. So our, our mean vector here is just a collection of the mean on the points that we're looking at. And uh, the covariance matrix we've already seen here. Okay, so just like we had the Gaussian update equations, this might look you know, a little intimidating. You're like, whoa, what's that? All that is is the Gaussian update equations. So that same mu of A given B that we looked at, it's just, it's, that's all this is. So we're just looking at, uh, we want to make this prediction the, we want to predict at y hat given our y values that we've already observed. And then we have 
just, this is just from the, the Gaussian update equations here. So this is the mean at, the, at the, all of the predicted values. And then we're looking at the covariance between the points we want to predict at and the points we've already seen. And then the, the covariance between the points that we've, we've seen as well. And an important point to notice here is that the covariance does not depend on the actual values that you see. So you can see in the, in the covariance term, y does not show up at all. So your, your uncertainty regions around your, your Gaussian process, they don't depend on what you've seen at all. So that's, that's just an important point to keep in mind. It's only that spatial relationship of where you have data and where you don't have data that's being represented there. OK, and so we, we have some notebooks that we'll see uh, later of how you would actually you know, code this up and uh, implement it. So um, we'll, we'll get to the actual implementation side as well of this. All right, so this is just another sort of visual example here of these are your, your uh, fit points. Those are, oops, those are the points that you've taken uh, measurements at and you've observed the function. And then you have your predicted mean here using the, the Gaussian update equations we just saw on the previous slide. And the important point to notice here is that the further that we get from our data regions, so where we've actually observed these points, the further we get from that, the larger our uncertainty is. So our uncertainty grows the further away we get from the, the data. And this is the nice feature about the Gaussian process is it sort of tells you, hey, you're in a regime over here where you don't have where you don't have a lot of data, so you shouldn't be too confident in those predictions. So it's, it's sort of that flag of, this is, what I, this is what I think, but you're not very certain about this, so you know, don't go making any life and death decisions based on this prediction here. Whereas when you're closer to the points you've seen so far, you have, you have that lower uncertainty there. Okay, and, and we also already saw, we saw the visual example, but incorporating noisy measurements is quite easy. So in this, in this case, we have perfect function, uh, function evaluation. So we're observing it perfectly. But in the real world, that's often not the case. So if we want to incorporate that uncertainty in our, in our measurements that we have, it's pretty straightforward by introducing. So this is the actual function, f of x. And then we're adding some, some random uh, noise onto that. And so if we want to include that now in in uh, the model that we're working with here, it's pretty straightforward. The only change we're making is adding in this, this new term here. That's all, that's all that we've done. We're just in, incorporating that uncertainty in, in the points that we've seen so far. And so just like before, we can write the Gaussian update equations here. And the only thing that's changed is just, just adding that in there. That's the, that's the only change that we have, OK? So it's, it's very straightforward to account for the noise. And if we want to just look at how this changes it, we already saw that initial example. But now, around the data points that we have, we still have some uncertainty there. OK, so it's, it's allowing us to account for that in our model. And if we, if we want to compare that to before, basically all you're seeing is that the uncertainty is collapsed when we have no noise. And when we do have noise, we just, we're still accounting for that as well. Yeah. And we're choosing this new measurement? Yes, yeah. So that would be sort of, you, you would characterize your sensor. You would know sort of how, how uncertain am I in the values that I'm getting. And based on that, you would sort of put that into your model and say, this is the, the sensor uncertainty here. Yeah. The confidence regions you've got put up, is there a convention on what it is like? Is it a single variance? Is it the 95% confidence interval? Yeah, it's, uh, what, I'm, what we're showing here, I believe, is the 95% confidence bound. So it's like the whatever Z star score that corresponds to. Yeah. But yeah, it can, it can vary too. OK, so we're working our way through probabilistic surrogate models. The, the next thing we're going to look at is actually fitting the Gaussian process. So we've got some data, and now we want to uh, fit that data the best that we can. So I sort of already touched on, on this example with the, the phone prices, but we'll, we'll dive into it a little bit more. So we have some, some data, some historical data of, of phone prices to sales that we have here. And 
we want to, our, our boss comes to us and says, I want to, uh, I want to look at changing the price of this phone. And there's three different, three different prices I'm considering changing the price to. And I want you to tell me what's our, our forecast for the new sales that we're going to, to get. So for this example, like let's say just for visualization purposes, these are the actual values that we would see. We don't know that though. All we can see is the blue points. That's all we've observed so far. And so if you hadn't taken this class, maybe you would just go to your boss and say, well, I fit a line to this data and here is what I think the, uh, the prediction is. And so maybe you get lucky and your boss decides to go with, you know, the far price on the left and you're not that far off from your prediction and you get a promotion. But maybe, maybe you're unlucky and your boss decides to go with the middle price point and you're way off and your boss is not happy with you at that point. So basically we can, we can often do better than just the linear fit by, by looking at the maximum likelihood of, of our data. So our goal here is we want to find the parameters. So we're going to parameterize our, our Gaussian process. And so if, if we want to think about what, what is the parameter here, well, for the squared exponential kernel, that's our length scale. But you can even take that further and you can say, well, the, the kernel function itself is the parameter. So maybe you have different uh, kernel functions as your parameters. That starts getting a bit complicated. So for our example, we'll just talk about the length scale is one of our parameters here. Okay, so we want, to, we want to look at the probability of our data, that's our y, given the x's that we've seen and the parameters of our model, okay? So uh, what we're actually going to work with is the log likelihood here. And so for, with, our, with our Gaussian, you can remember that we just have the expression. It's just this uh, 2 pi to the negative n over 2. And then we have the uh, inverse, or, or the negative 1 half, so the square root of the determinant of our sigma. And then we have the, the exponent term here. OK? And so if we want to take the log probability of this, all that is is just taking the log. So if we do that, we take the log of this expression, we're just going to end up with uh, negative n over 2 and then uh, similarly we're going to have just the log determinant here and since we're working with logs remember we can just just add them up and then the log here is going to cancel out and so we're just left with uh, that term on the inside. Okay, so pretty, pretty straightforward for, the, for a Gaussian distribution. We just get something, some nice analytical expression like that. The good news is that if we want to extend this to the Gaussian process, we get the exact same thing. The only difference that you see is that we've introduced the, uh, the K of theta. So that's our, our covariance matrix now. Is just, instead of, instead of sigma, all sigma is, is just the, the kernel function parameterized by whatever our parameters are, in this case our length scale, and then plus that, uh, that uncertainty term. Similarly, the only difference in our mu is that it's, we, we don't write it as mu now, we're saying it's, it's m theta of x, so it's just a mean vector based on the, the data points that we're, we're looking at. So this is great news because we have this analytical expression for this, and so that makes maximum likelihood estimation really easy. So the good news, we can fit the parameters of the Gaussian process using maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, and so say, say in this example we go and we actually do that. This is just, these aren't real values. These are just, you know, for, for visualization. Maybe we go and do that and we get a great looking fit um, and we, we do really well and our boss is much happier with us than, than our linear uh, regression estimate. And on top of that, we can also tell our boss how confident we are in our prediction based on, on the modeling assumptions that we've made. Okay, so that's, that's how we would go about fitting the Gaussian process. So just to, to, to summarize the probabilistic surrogate models that we've seen so far, just all they are is just a distribution over functions now. We've just saw that, that example where we just scaled it up. They're just distributions over functions. And we've seen that the choice of the kernel that you're actually choosing, that has a pretty 
significant impact on the, uh, the smoothness of the functions and the types of functions that you're getting. We also saw that we can, we can incorporate measurement noise. It's relatively straightforward to do that. And then lastly, we can fit the, those parameters using maximum likelihood estimation. Yes? Uh, two questions. First one, um, can you represent other types of noise besides additive using a Gaussian process? Or is that more complicated and you can't, like, it wouldn't really hold? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what, what types of noise are you, are you thinking about there? Multiplicative, for example, right, where your like, noise is dependent on your particular explanation. Yeah, I, I think you should be able to. It's more it's more just adding a term to your covariance. Matrix. Right, yeah, yeah, you can't, yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to just add it in like we did with the new, but it seems like th there probably is a way to do that. Um, and then uh, if you're trying to, for example, extrapolate your fit rather than trying to interpolate between values, do the kernel functions need to be kind of bounded, or can some of them be unbounded as you kind of get further and further away from the points that you actually get? Yeah, good question. So um, in the example that we saw here, looking at the extrapolation, so here because we were just using uh, the squared exponential kernel with a zero mean, you sort of see that decay. It's just going back to zero because we're saying our mean function is zero. So as we get further, further and further away, you just decay back. But if you're using a different mean function, um, different kernel function, I would say still has some in, uh, impact, but the main result you're seeing here is due to the zero mean. So if you had some, some different type of mean function, maybe you're looking at like, you're saying it's a, a linear based on the points you've seen, then yeah, you, you could be unbounded and you could just keep increasing based on that, uh, that relationship that you saw. Okay, so we're gonna transition now. So we've, we've sort of seen how to, uh, how to model with the, the Gaussian process. Now we're gonna transition from how to model to how to sample, right? And that's, that's what our, our optimization is sort of focused on is selecting these, these sample points to, to get our function evaluations at. So we still wanna keep this, this high level you know, roadmap picture in mind where we, we have you know, few samples at the start and then we're, we're choosing our sample locations so that we better learn what the function actually is that we're interested in. And so that's what the surrogate optimization is focused on is, is how to sample the function. Okay, so the, the first one that we're gonna look at is prediction-based exploration. And so if you, Think back to quadratic fit search. That's essentially the same exact thing as uh, prediction-based exploration. So as a refresher, in quadratic fit search, you're just looking at the, the, three, the last three bracketing points, and you're fitting a, quadra a quadratic function to those, those points. So that's kind of like your surrogate model, right? You're just saying, okay, we have a, we have a quadratic surrogate model, and then we're gonna take the minimum of that quadratic function, and we're gonna sample wherever that minimum is. And that's all prediction-based exploration is doing. The only difference now is you're not using a quadratic function, you're using the mean, the predicted mean of your Gaussian process. Okay, so it's the same exact thing, it's just your, your model is no longer uh, the quadratic function. Okay, so if we wanna look at, look at this in uh, detail, we're, we're taking the sample at the minimum of the predicted mean. So we can actually look at this through, through a real example here. So to, to break this down, the black function, just like we've been looking at, this black curve here, is the true function. The data that we've seen so far is this, this point here, and there's another point here. The red point is the point that we're actually gonna take the sample at. So there's, there's a black point, it might be hard to see, but there's a black point underneath that red point. The blue is the predicted mean from our Gaussian process. So we look at where is the minimum of this predicted mean, and in this case, the minimum is right about here. So then we say, okay, we're gonna sample at that point, just like we did in quadratic fit search. So we go and we sample there. So we take the sample, we've now added it, there's two samples here. It, it kind of looks like one, but there's two. We update based on the Gaussian update equation, so we update our predicted mean. 
we see that the new predicted minimum is now right about here. So then we, we, we say, OK, we're going to sample there at that red point. So we go and sample at that point, and then we repeat. And we update our, our Gaussian process. We get a new predicted mean. And then we, we select another sample location. And then it gets us pretty close to the minimum. So we can say, OK, great, we're done. Prediction-based exploration, close the book, we're good to go. The only issue with that is that obviously this was a very nice, this was a very nice example to uh, start out with. So you can imagine, and it's not very hard to come up with a counterexample of where this, this wouldn't work out too well. Okay, so if instead our function had looked something like this, right? And so we had started over here with these two points. And we had said that our predicted mean looked something like this, you know, something like that. And then we went through our sampling. It would take us, you know, to this local minimum. But then we've totally missed out on this one over here, since we were just focused on what was going on over here. And we never even considered this part over here. OK, so that's the issue with prediction-based exploration, is that often we we sort of just get stuck in these local minima, and it's not really doing any exploring of the space. The other thing to keep in mind is that it's not taking uncertainty into account at all. So we just went through all this work of making sure that our, our probabilistic surrogate model is representing the uncertainty in our data, and now we're not even, we're not even using that. So it's kind of, a kind of a waste. Like, why did we even do that in the first place? It does take it into account a little bit when we're actually doing the the mean prediction. So it's there, but we're not really using that in our, in our exploration. And then the, the other point is that the new samples are often very close to the existing samples. So it's, it's sort of a waste of sampling there. All right, so if we want to do a little better, and maybe now we say, OK, well, we didn't do any exploration at all. So let's, let's do some exploration here. So error-based is looking at where the standard deviation, the predicted standard deviation, is the greatest. So we're, we're choosing our samples to maximize that, uh, that predicted standard deviation. And so uh, you can think about this because the, the larger the standard deviation is, the more, the more uncertain we are in the actual uh, true function there. So we're sort of saying we want to become more certain in our function. And that's, that's sort of our, our guide here for this exploration. So if we look at, again, same exact uh, example here, we're going to start out. And now we're, we're also visualizing the uncertainty here. So we start out. And instead, where prediction base was just taking a sample here, this goes directly to the bounds of, this, of the domain. And so because our uncertainty is greatest at the bounds, we just sort of clamp those down first right away. So we sample at the left bound, then we sample at the right bound. And then we sort of get into it of, uh, actually going through, through uh, and it, so the, the next highest uncertainty is sort of on that left peak there. So we sample there. And now we're sort of just like playing whack-a-mole with the uncertainty, right? So we, we clamp one down, and then another, um, another one pops up, so we go and we whack that mole. And we're just sort of continuing to play whack-a-mole here with, with error-based exploration. And so we can just keep going through it wherever the, the uncertainty is the highest, sample at those locations. And we end, up, we, we end up with a pretty good you know, understanding of, of what our function looks like. And we've distributed our samples pretty well throughout the, the sampling process. The only issue here now is that often the functions that we're interested in are defined over very large domains, sometimes just all of Rn, right? And so they're, they're unbounded functions. And in the case where they are unbounded, you saw what, what error-based exploration wanted to do. It goes straight to the bounds. In this case, we have bounded it, so we put the domains as only, it can only go between those. So if you're working with problems where you know the bounds pretty well, like say for the, the phone price example, you know that your, your phone, the, the sales corresponding to the price, the price has to be greater than zero, right? And you're not gonna make it, you know, a million dollars for a phone. So that one we'd say is pretty well bounded. But in a lot of other applications, you don't have those bounds on it. And that's where, where you run into some issues with, with error-based. 
Okay, so it has to be constrained to that, that closed region. Yes? Suppose your problem is kind of high dimensional. Would it try to go to all the corners first, I guess? Yeah, yeah. So if, if you took it like into many higher dimensions where you're looking at, I don't like you have some hypercube that you've bounded it to, you're going to go to, because the, the error is going to be greatest, unless you already have samples at those, those bounds. So if you don't have samples there, that's where, that's where you're going to go and sample at those, those bounds first. Yes? Uh, what is the relation between sigma hat and the kernel? Sigma hat and the kernel. Yes, that's a great, uh, great question. So you can back out sigma hat. So from your, your covariance matrix, um, if you look at the diagonal terms, those are, uh, those are essentially the, the variance at each of your points. So how much, so you can think about the diagonal here is basically what we're showing here. The, the, only, the only caveat is that there's a, a square root in there because we're going from variance to standard deviation. But yeah, it's just the, the, uh, the diagonals. Okay, so we've seen error-based, we've seen prediction-based, and we've seen some of the, the drawbacks to both of them. Lower confidence bound is essentially just taking a combination of both. So if you re recall what we just saw, in prediction-based, we're trying to minimize the predicted mean, and in error-based, we're trying to sample at the maximum of the standard deviation. So now lower confidence bound is just combining those together, and it does that combination just through this parameter alpha. So alpha is sort of controlling the weight that you're giving to prediction-based versus error-based. Okay, and the, the minus sign here is just keep that in mind because in error-based, we were trying to take the maximum of the standard deviation. Here, we're trying to minimize this lower confidence bound. So that's why we, we get that minus sign. And so this is just really sort of focus on the, it's a balance of the exploitation exploration trade-off where here prediction-based is trying to exploit the samples that we've already seen. So we already have samples in specific regions. Prediction-based is just saying, hey, I already know like what's going on here. I can probably do better if I sample closer to that and exploit the knowledge that I already have. Whereas the exploration side is the error-based where we're saying, hey, we really don't know what's going on over there. Let's go explore, let's go find that out. And so you have that sort of tug of war going on between the two, and your alpha is the parameter that's controlling, controlling that, how much priority you're given to one versus the other. So when alpha, if you set alpha to zero, then you're just gonna be doing all prediction based. And if you set alpha to infinity, then you're gonna be doing all error based. Alpha somewhere in the middle, you're gonna be a, a balance between the two. And so alpha, that's another parameter that you would, you would set for your specific uh, application. So we can look at how this actually performs. So we see, we see here, same exact example again, um, and just keep in mind that we're trying to minimize the lower bound. So we're trying to sample where this, this red line is low. So lower values are good. And the other thing we want to see is that you can see the sort of balance here. When the predicted mean is high, but we have large uncertainty, we still get a good value for the, the lower bound. Similarly, when we have these, these lower values here with no uncertainty, we're saying that basically it's, it's only the, uh, the predicted mean there, okay? So we're just gonna go through and sample wherever that, that red line, wherever our lower confidence bound is lowest. So we start off here, and I would say this is, this is sort of an exploration one, but you know, it's, not, it's not exactly one is exploration, one is exploitation. But then we go here, and this is definitely more of, a, of exploiting what we already know because we're predicting the mean to be pretty low there. And then we continue on, and the next one we get, I would say this is definitely more of an ex, uh, exploration term. Okay? So we're sort of balancing that here through, through the alpha that we've chosen. And we can continue on. And again, we, we end up with something that looks pretty reasonable here. And by the end, we get, we get a, a reasonable uh, distribution of samples and also a pretty good characterization of our, of our actual function. Okay, so now the only issue is that, well, you still have the bounds issue, right? Because your, your uncertainty is still gonna grow as you go to the, the bounds of the domain. So you still have that, 
but you have a little bit more control over that because if you if you choose an alpha such that you're not really caring as much about your standard deviation, you won't necessarily always be going to those, those bounds. So it sort of takes care of the problem, but it's, it's still there, okay? But it's just trying to take the best of both of prediction base and error base and combine them together. Okay, so now we're going to look at probability of improvement and I think this, this one makes a lot of intuitive sense for why we would want to do it. And so let's get just sort of a picture started here to work with. Okay, so let's say that our true function looks something like this. And maybe we've sampled here, we've sampled here, and maybe we've sampled here so far. Okay, and then we've, we've updated our Gaussian process. We've gotten some new uh, predicted mean, and maybe our mean looks something like this. So now probability of improvement is asking, at any point along here, what's the probability that I'm going to do better than what I've seen so far? So the best that we've seen so far, remember we're trying to minimize, so the best we've seen so far is this point right here. This is our y min. So we're asking everywhere along here, what's the probability that I'm going to be below y min? So say, for example, we actually want to look at this at one specific point. So let's say, what's the probability of improvement right here at this x value? So we're going to come over here and we're going to look we're going to say, OK, at, th at this point, so at this specific x, we're going to look at what is, our, what is our predicted mean from our Gaussian process right now. So that's right here, right? We're saying we predict it right there. And remember, we have a predicted mean and a predicted variance, or standard deviation. So with that, we can get a distribution, right? So if we just draw that distribution on here, it's going to look something like this. Right? So we've just, we've just sort of dropped the, the bell curve down there based on whatever variance we currently have at that point. All right, So we have our mean. We have our standard deviation. We want to know what's the probability that we're going to do better than this. So to see that, we're just going to draw across from here. So we, we want to do better than this y min value. right? And now I think it's pretty clear to see, well, the, the probability that we're going to do better than that y min, it's just this tail of the distribution here. Right? So that's, that's our probability of improvement. If we integrate this, this tail from negative infinity up to this y min value, that is the probability that we're going to be doing better than what we've seen so far. OK, so any questions there? We'll, we'll write out the actual math for this in a second. But any questions on the, the intuition side? OK. So what actually is the, the improvement, right? We can say that our improvement, it's just however much better we're doing than that y, that y min that we've seen. So it's just going to be our y min minus whatever y we actually see. So if we're below it, then we're going to be improving. If we're not below it, we're just going to have 0. So this is only if y is less than or equal to y min. OK, so that's our, that's our improvement function. Now, we're interested in looking at the probability of improvement, right? So we want to know what's the probability that we're doing better than, than this right now. And so based on, our, based on our picture that we've drawn, we can say the probability that y is less than or equal to y min, right? That's just, we're just integrating up from negative infinity all the way up. So we know that this is, just, this is just the cumulative distribution function here. So we go from negative infinity to y min. And it's just based on that Gaussian that we have with our whatever our mu hat and whatever our sigma hat is. And we're just, this is a y. We're just integrating that up. So 
as, as I said, this is just the, the cumulative distribution function, which we can write like this. And so this basically just converts it to a, a standard normal through that, uh, that conversion there. And we're just looking at integrating up that tail. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, why why min is the upper bound. Yeah, so the upper bound is just this this y min here. All right. So yeah, same picture that's up here, and if we want to look at how this actually performs. So yeah, I just have written we want to max. So we want to sample now at the points where this probability of improvement is the highest. So if we start off here, you can see that when, when we already have a sample, right, our sigma hat there is going to be zero. So this would be, you know, we would have a divide by zero here, which would be undefined. But we can sort of just say, well, we know we're not going to improve if we sample there again, because we already know what the function value is. So the improvement there is just zero. So that's why we have these spikes here, where it, it just drops down. But then what you see is right around those, those points that we already have, we have a, that's where the highest probability of improvement is, is right very close to where we've already sampled. So we go ahead and we sample at where the probability of improvement is high. Now we have two samples there. We've also, we have technically improved our function. We got a lower value. And so now our, prob our probability of improvement is really high, right? Because now we have very little uncertainty there. We sort of have that predicted mean is decreasing. So we're saying, let's keep sampling there, right? We've seen that we're, we're doing good, so we're going to keep on sampling there. And we just kind of keep going down along that route. So I think this is a little disappointing to see because it's a really nice setup, right? It makes sense. You're looking at the tail. You're kind of talking about what's the probability we're going to do better than this. But then in practice, what we actually see is that often we end up very similar to prediction-based, where we're sampling very close to the samples that we've already seen. So that's kind of a bummer. And just like we said, it tends to, it tends to actually do the job, right? It's, it is decreasing the objective, but we're doing it, one, in that just local area, so we could be susceptible to the local minima. And two, it's, it's sort of wasting our, our samples again. So I think the, the natural extension of this would be not just looking at what's uh, the probability of improvement, but what, we, what do we actually expect that improvement to be, right? Because probability of improvement was just saying, whatever the, wherever the probability is highest, let's go there. Expected improvement is now saying, let's look at not just the probability that we're going to improve, but how much do we actually think we're going to improve by. So if we want to, to look at this now, We're going to just start off by doing a very just simple change of variables. And it'll be clear why, we, why we're doing this in a second. But we're going to introduce this z variable. And we're going to say that that z is just equal to y minus mu hat over our sigma hat. And we're going to say y min prime here is equal to our y min minus our mu hat over sigma hat. So we're just converting it to, to standard. Uh, standard normal. That's why we're doing this change of variables. And you'll see it'll, it'll make some, some stuff work out nicer here. So we do this change of variables, and now we want to rewrite our, our improvement function that I think I've covered up here. So our, our improvement function now with this change of variables is just going to be sigma hat times y min prime minus z. And this is if our uh, this is if z is less than or equal to our y min prime. And it's 0 otherwise. So all we've done here is we just took what we had before was y min minus y. We've now just subbed in our, our change of variables here to get us this new improvement function. OK, so now, now we're interested in the expected value of this improvement function. So if we look at the expected value, If we, if we take the expectation, remember it's just the, we're just integrating over 
the probability distribution where we take the expected value of the function times the probability. That's all expected value is, is just value times the probability of that value. So the function value here is just this, this improvement. So it's just this term. We don't care about when it's zero because we know that'll just be zero. So we're going to have sigma hat on the outside here because it, it's constant. And our bounds of integration, again, are from same, same as before, negative infinity up to y min. But here we've introduced the change of variables, so it's y min prime now. OK, and then we're just going to bring this in. So y min prime minus our z. So that's our function value. And then our function, uh, pr or the probability of this, right, is just now we, now we see it's just the standard normal, right? Because we've made that change of variables. So that's why we did it. So this is just the expect, the, it's, this is all it is, is the expected improvement here that we've written. All right, and so there's not much that we can do with it in this form, right? Because we have this integral here. So we want to we wanna simplify this a little bit. So to simplify this, we're just going to break up, break up that integral. So the first term, we're going to have our sigma hat is going to be on the outside now. And we're just going to write, write that first term. So our y min prime doesn't depend on our, our z here. So we can bring that out of the integration. And we're just going from negative infinity to y min prime. And it's just going to be uh, our, our distribution for z here. Okay, so that term, that's good, because we know this is exactly what we saw before. This is just the probability of improvement for z. So that term is almost already taken care of. We'll simplify it in the next step, but this is, we're looking good here. Then we're just going to bring in this, this other term. So we're going to have the minus here, and we're going to go negative infinity, y min prime again, of z, and then the standard normal here. OK? So we know that this is just the expected value of z, right? Because we have value times probability. So that's our expected value of z. And we know because it's the standard normal, if we were going from negative infinity to positive infinity, it would just be 0, right? Because it's just the expected value of a standard normal Gaussian. And that's 0, because that's our, our mean. In this case, we're not going from negative infinity to positive infinity. We're going from negative infinity to y min prime. And so what this ends up actually working out to is we have this nice result, result for, uh, for Gaussians where it comes out to being this term would just be uh, our y min prime given our mean and standard deviation. And then it's going to be minus the, uh, the other bounds of integration, which is at negative infinity. OK? Where we know here the likelihood at negative infinity is just 0, because there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no tail there, right, as we go to infinity. So we can just get rid of this. That's just 0. And if you're curious on how we got from this step to this step, well, if you actually want to work it out, you'd have to introduce the actual expression here for the Gaussian. And then it's just you know, a couple of lines to get from there to here. But we know this nice result that we can work with for Gaussians, where we can just take the tail here of, uh, of the bounds of integration and sub it in. So that's all I've done for those two steps. So now we're ready to simplify this. right? We just have this term and this term. So if we will uh, simplify it and get our final expression here. So the, uh, the, what we actually come out to now is we're going to have uh, this sigma hat still multiplying everything. And then we're going to have the y min prime times the probability that z is less than or equal to y min prime. And then we have just this term here. OK, and now if we want to sub back in and uh, re reverse our change of variables here to get our final result, we can go ahead and do that. And what we're going to end up with is y min minus y minus our mu, our mu hat.
And that's going to be times this probability, where it's now probability that y is less than or equal to y min. And then this term is just going to become sigma hat squared. And then we're going to have uh, this, this will be y min. And our distribution is now with respect to mu hat and sigma hat. OK, and so this is the final expression for our expected improvement that we've now switched it back to. OK, so that was sort of how we how we get to this result. And so now this is nice because we have our probability of improvement there. We have how much we're sort of expecting to improve this by and the likelihood here. And then we've also we've included sort of that that uh, distribution term there for our uh, uncertainty. OK, so now we can actually implement this and see how we perform on this expected improvement metric. And so this is just the, these are the steps uh, that I just went through here. And I didn't make any typos, so that's good. OK, so now if we actually uh, implement this, um, we're seeing the exact uh, same example as before, where our expected improvement is shown on the bottom. So we start off, and we're going to sample actually very close to the minimum. So I think this is just more of a, a nice example here that we start off doing that. It won't always be the case. Uh, then we go, we go to the bounds next, and we sort of clamp those down. So you can still see we have that, that dependence on the bounded region. Um, and then lastly, we end, up, uh, we end up sampling there. So it definitely does better than probability of improvement, right? And, and now it it's sort of, I think, intuitively makes sense that you're looking at not just what's the likelihood I'll improve, but how much do I actually expect to improve by. So I think it, it makes a lot of sense there on, on why you would uh, want to use this, this type of method. OK, so this is just sort of the main point. We're just looking at where we expected to improve it uh, as, as much as possible. And so if we want to look at a really quick comparison of expected improvement versus probability of improvement, uh, for this specific example, we can compare the two. So on the left, we have probability of improvement. On the right, we have expected improvement. And so if we go ahead and we sample at the maximum of both of those, we can sort of see how they, how, how they would differ. So if we actually look at, at where they would sample, the probability of improvement, like we saw before, is sampling very close to where we've already seen whereas expected improvement is doing a little bit better and going to, to regions that we haven't yet seen. OK, so we, we've seen that we can use the probabilistic surrogate model, the Gaussian process, to sort of guide where we're going to place our samples. And an uh, important thing to keep in mind is all of the strategies that we've talked about here, they're just looking at the next sample location. OK, they're not taking into account a sequence of samples. And so that would involve some some dis, uh, sequential, dis, sequential decision making, which is sort of what uh, my research is focused on, is how do you use these surrogate models to then look at placing a sequence of samples, not just that, that next sample. OK, so that's the, uh, that's the overview of everything we've talked about. We have two minutes left here. So really quickly, uh, this notebook will be posted. But I just wanted to give you a, a brief overview of the structure of it. Um, and then you can, you can play around with it on your own. Uh, but basically, this just implements everything that we looked at today. And so there's this, uh, there's this GP file here that has a lot of the structure behind it and some of the helper functions that are being used. But I'm just going to highlight the, the, main, the main part that you need uh, to get started. So this uh, structure here is just all we need to specify our Gaussian process. And it, this is all in Julia, a, a real programming language. <laughs> so so all, all we need is just that mean. We're doing zero mean. Uh, we're, we have our squared exponential kernel here. And then these are just the data points that we've seen so far, our y's, and then uh, the new term. And here we're saying we have uh, perfectly observable measurements. I'll, I'll wrap this up quickly so we can just, this is just implementing this, what might have seemed scary to you at first. It's not scary at all. We can just implement it in these few lines here of doing this prediction. So we're just putting these equations into code. And uh, then we can actually go ahead and run it. So I'll just highlight some of the examples. So we can just sample like different functions that we saw before. Uh, we can do it in two dimensions as well. And then we can actually uh, look at some 
some of the different exploration strategies. So if we're doing prediction based, this will actually like walk you through each one of those and you can see how the samples would change based on what, uh, what your function looks like. So you can go ahead and play around with that. We've uh, implemented it for all of them. So for expected improvement, everything you can go take a look at that. And uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you would have as well. Thank you.